Hello, in this simple chapter, we are going to talk about electric current and resistance. We will introduce Ohm's law and then later on we will define electric power. But before talking about any of that, I want to discuss batteries a little bit as they will be the voltage sources that we are going to use in our circuits. An electric battery is a device that converts chemical energy into electrical energy and its sole purpose is to provide a constant voltage across its terminals, a constant potential difference between its terminals. In today's technology, there are different types of batteries that you can come across from single-use carbon batteries to chargeable nickel-metal hybrid batteries, lithium-ion batteries that we have in our smartphones, and acid-based car or motorcycle batteries, and so on and so forth. Even though their technology is different, they have so much in common. They all have a positive electrode, a negative electrode, and a medium which allows charge transfer between these electrodes. Now, to get ourselves familiar with the working of a battery, maybe what we should do is we should consider a very simple acid-based car battery. So in these kind of batteries, uh, the medium, the medium uh, that allows the charge transfer between the electrodes, which by the way is called electrolyte, this electrolyte is acid-based, a diluted, diluted acid. And for the electrodes, we will have a zinc uh, electrode here and a carbon electrode here. Now, how does this battery work? It's very simple, actually. This acid will start to eat away the zinc electrode and the atoms leave. And as they leave, they will leave an electron behind. So with this, you are going to have your zinc electrode negatively charged. So this is going to be, this is going to be R anode. So now what you have within the electrolyte is these positive ions. And as these positive ions reach the carbon electrode, what they will want to do is they want to be complete again. So they're going to take an electron from the carbon electrode. So the carbon electrode now will be positively charged. And the positively charged electrodes are called cathodes and this will continue for a while increasing the charges on these electrodes this will however will not go forever and eventually an equilibrium will be reached why well because this positively charged electrode will have so much positive charge on it now that it will not allow positive charges within the electrolyte to reach it and take away more electrons. Remember the repulsive force between like charges. As these electrodes get charged, a potential difference between them will develop and once the equilibrium is reached, there will be a constant voltage across the terminals. When we connect this battery to a circuit, now the charge is flowing from the battery, we are driving the circuit here. So to keep the voltage constant, more zinc atoms will be dissolved by the electrolyte and this will keep going for a while but eventually the electrode would be completely depleted so the battery needs to be replaced. So long story short the batteries are constant voltage sources. Now that we have a very basic understanding of how batteries work let's go ahead and define the electric current. Now the electric current is defined as how much charge passes through a conductor per unit time. Or another way to rephrase that would be the rate at which the electric charge flows through a conductor is called the electric current. To see what this means, let's have a look at this very simple circuit. So what I have here is a device and a battery that are connected to each other by means of conducting wires. Now this device can be a light bulb or a heater, it doesn't really matter. So we have a complete circuit here. And you remember what happens if there's a potential difference, there will be a flow of charge from higher to lower potential or lower to higher potential, depending on the sign of the charge. So consider this point in this circuit. Since there's a flow of charge that is basically circulating on the circuit, there will be some charges passing through this point here. And the current is defined as 
I'm going to use capital I for the current and I'm going to put a bar here to let you know that I'm talking about an average current here is going to be equal to the amount of charge that passed through that point divided by the amount of time it took. So this is our average, average current. And as you can see, the unit for the electric current should be coulombs per second. But we are going to give this guy a special name, which we are going to call ampere. So one coulomb per second will be equal to one ampere. So let's just write this here. If you want to define the instantaneous current, you know what to do. You are going to make this delta T infinitely small. So the instantaneous current will be equal to dQ over dT, the amount of charge that passes through this point in an infinitely small amount of time. Again, obviously, the unit will be amperes. The conventional definition of the electric current was defined as if it was the positive charges that moves in a circuit. So it will always flow from higher potential to the lower potential. So it's going to go in this direction. So this is the conventional definition of the electric current. But now we know better. In conductors, it is the electrons that move. So the electrons will go from lower potential to the higher potential. So they're going to go in this direction. So this is the flow of electrons. But since the conventional definition got stuck, we will keep using that. Also of note is that in order to have a current running through a circuit, the circuit must be complete. If the path for charges to follow is not complete, we call this an open circuit, such as this one, and there will be no current running through that circuit. Actually, that is how the switches work by completing or breaking a circuit. You did see this in the first experiment that you did on the Wheatstone bridge. Actually, there was another thing that you saw in that experiment, which was usually the circuit diagrams representing a physical circuit most likely do not look like the circuit you built. Remember, the circuit that you built in that experiment had long wires that needed to be connected to each other, to the power supply, to the switch, and so on and so forth, with so many wires uh, in the picture. It looked very ugly, but the circuit diagram representing that was so clean. Okay, now let's solve a very simple example and move to resistance. Now, in this example, it is told us that a steady current, by the way, steady current means a constant current, of 2 amperes is flowing in a circuit for 5 minutes. It's asking us to determine the number of electrons passing by a point within the circuit in this time interval. So in order to determine the number of electrons, I need to first find out how much charge passes through a given point. And for that, I'm going to make use of the definition of the electric current. Now we define the average current as the amount of charge passing through the point divided by the time it took. Now since this is a steady current, it means that the average current is actually nothing but equal to our instantaneous current. So if I were to solve this for delta Q, all I'm going to get is I times delta T. So delta Q from here will be equal to 2 amperes, but I know amperes is nothing but coulombs per second by definition, right? And I need to multiply this with 5 minutes, but I know that 5 minutes is nothing but 5 times 60 seconds. So if we calculate this, what we are going to get is delta Q, delta Q is equal to 600 coulombs. So we got our delta Q. Now, the number of electrons is quite easy to figure out. The number of electrons, the number of electrons will be equal to the amount of charge divided by the charge of a single electron. I use uh, absolute value here because the charge of the electron is negative. 
So this is going to be equal to delta Q divided by E, which is 600 coulombs divided by the charge of the electron was 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So if you calculate this, you will find the number of electrons, the number of electrons to be 3.7 times 10 to the 21. So in five minutes, apparently, this huge number of electrons will pass through a given point in this circuit. All right, now let's go ahead and discuss what resistance is. In order to have a current running on a conducting wire such as this one, what we need is a potential difference between the ends of it. So let's say, let's, let's call this point A and point B. So I'm going to have VA is larger than VB and VA minus VB, let's call this V. This is the voltage across this wire. So this is the end that's at a higher potential and this is the end that's at a lower potential. In this case, you know that the current runs from higher potential to lower potential. So the current's direction is this way. Now in 18th century, uh, the German scientist Georg Simon Ohm shown that the current running through a conducting wire, a metal wire, is actually directly proportional to the voltage across it. So if we were to write it here, the voltage across the wire is equal to I times the constant of proportionality. This is known as the Ohm's law. Ohm's law. Here R is actually called the resistance of the wire. And the unit for the resistance is, as you can see, volts per amp. Volts per amp. And we are going to give this guy a special name. We are going to call that 1 ohm. So this is uh, the unit for resistance. And if you reverse the sign of the voltage, meaning if you make this end at a higher potential than this one, but let's say it has the same magnitude V, then the current will be in the opposite direction, but it will have the same magnitude, which means the resistance of the wire will not change with the polarity of the voltage. What I'm trying to tell you here is actually what this expression is telling us here is that when you double the voltage, the current doubles with it. If you triple the voltage, the current will triple with it. And R is always a positive quantity, which means, which means if you negate the voltage, if you apply a negative voltage, then the current must be negative so that you will have a positive resistance. What it means for current to be negative is, if you choose this direction for the current to be positive, then if the current flows in the other direction, the current will be negative. And even though I keep talking about directions here, please note that the electric current is not a vector. So if it goes in one way, we will call the current positive, and if it goes the other way, we will call the current negative. So if we were to plot I versus V graph, we will get a straight line here. And the slope of this straight line will give us 1 over R. Even though Ohm's law covers quite a lot of uh, devices and materials such as metals, conductors, many semiconductor devices, for example diodes, transistors, do not obey Ohm's law. Just to give you guys an idea, the IV graph for a diode looks something like this. So you can see it's not linear, meaning it doesn't really obey the Ohm's law. So what we are going to do is we are going to uh, call the devices that obey Ohm's law, ohmic devices, and the devices such as the diode here that do not obey Ohm's law, we are going to call them non-ohmic devices. And during the remainder of this course, we will only deal with ohmic devices. All devices that you can think of that we connect to circuits will have resistances on them. So if you connect them to a battery or a power source, there will be a current running through them and the current running through them can be found by using the Ohm's law. And the wires that we use to connect devices and the batteries to each other usually have very small resistances compared to the other components of the circuit. So what we are going to do is we are going to ignore their resistances. 
Now, in these kind of circuits, usually what we want to do is to control the current running through the circuit. What I mean is, let's say this device has a resistance of 1 ohms and we connect it to a battery of 6 volts. Now, the ohms law tells us that the current running through the device will be then 6 amps. But let's say 6 amps is a very large current for this device to handle. Now, what you need to do is you need to find a way to bring down the current. And you can easily do that by using a simple device called a resistor. So if you add the resistor in your circuit, now the current running through the circuit will be much, much smaller depending on how big the resistance of the resistor is here. For example, if it is 5 ohms, you have 5 ohms here, 1 ohm here, 6 ohms. So the net uh, resistance is 6 ohms and 6 volts here. So the current is actually brought down to 1 amps. By the way, we are going to talk about how you can calculate the equivalent resistance of resistors that are connected in series and in parallel in the coming chapters. So for the time being, I think this will suffice. Obviously, now that I have already used a resistor in a circuit diagram, you know what its symbol is. So this is the symbol that we are going to use for resistors. Let's say these are the points we connect this uh, resistor to the circuit. So if the current running through this uh, resistor is in this direction, then what it means is, from what we have learned from early on, this side of the resistor must be at a higher potential than this side of the resistor so that the current will flow from higher potential to the lower potential. Here is a picture of a bunch of resistors that you can look at. And as you can see, these uh, resistors have these color bands on them. And these color bands are actually used to let us know the resistance of these resistors. Here is a table that I took from Giancoli from chapter 25, which is actually showing us how does this color code work. So apparently if you have four color bands here, the first two are going to give you the first two digits. The third uh, band is your multiplier and the fourth band is the tolerance. I'm going to tell you what the tolerance is in a moment. So if you take a look at the resistance of this uh, particular resistor here, the first digit is red. Red is two apparently. The second digit is green. So you have five here. So we already have 25. Now the third digit is our multiplier. How it works is you first need to find that. So yellow apparently is 4. So the multiplier is actually 10 to the 4. So this is going to tell you what power of 10 you need to use. In this case it is 4. So 25 times 10 to the 4 ohms is the resistance of this resistor. Or if you want you can write this as I guess 250 kilo ohms. What about this tolerance? So we have silver here. So if you look at this table, silver is 10%. What it is telling you is the resistance of this guy is 250 kilo ohms plus minus 10% of 250 kilo ohms. So if you were to write it properly, I guess you should write it as 250 plus minus the 10% of this is 25 kilo ohms. So this is the resistance of this resistor and actually you can get resistors uh, with resistances ranging from a couple milli ohms to a couple hundred mega ohms so now i will leave you guys with some important clarifications to read through i will talk to you later in our next video have a nice day